Um, we will uh, hold the presentation and, and have regular question moments during the presentation. At any time when you have a question, do not hesitate uh, to use the, um, the uh, chat box at the bottom of your screen. So any moment you have a question, add it. The moment we stop, we will go and have a look through the questions that are already in the chat box. If there are still any questions at that moment, you can raise your hand and we can also address them one to one. And at the end, of course, there will also be a moment uh, to have a look at all the different questions. Please, um, Glyn, if you could go to the next slide. I think it's important uh, because we had a, a very challenging uh, past year um, that we that we spent some time on, on looking back on what we did. Uh, the agenda today is the Tiaka transformation to start with, uh, the new governance, uh, the future proofing. Uh, it's all about the members. So we would like to give a little bit update on the members. Then the industry priorities. Uh, COVID-19, something we cannot ignore, unfortunately, but also it gives some benefits on visibility to our industry, so something to, to look back at. Sustainability, the events we are planning, uh, the awards we are doing, and of course the Hall of Fame uh, as well. Uh, that's a bit the agenda for today. Uh, and of course, uh, I would like to start talking on the Tiaka transformation part. Um, so you can go to the next uh, slide, uh, Lynn. Yeah, it goes really slowly. That's the next slide. Is it still not loaded yet? Yeah, okay. Um, what was most important for Tiaka in the past year, that was three elements, I think more than ever, it was the financial sustainability and making sure that Tiaka was strong enough to take up the challenges requested and needed by our members in the long term. It's no doubt that Tiaka has had some, some difficult years financially, uh, not that much on a cash position, but that we were not able uh, to, to stop the cash drain from the association and that sooner or later uh, we would end up without cash. So we needed to, to change that, uh, that financial uh, stronghold of the association. Uh, a second thing that was really important is to make sure that we were relevant. Uh, if we said what was Tiaka uh, standing for, what were people looking at Tiaka, um, it, it was very often a very flu and grey uh, answer. Um, so being very relevant, being able to take up future challenges and taking position in the industry was something we wanted to work on. And of course, it's good to be financial strong again, to, uh, to have relevance. We also needed to make sure that Tiaka as an association itself was strong enough uh, and fit to deliver to these newly uh, redefined uh, ambitions. So we revised our vision, uh, we re revised our mission, the corporate values, to make sure that they are in line with members' expectations and needs, uh, but also today's world, uh, that you can consistently communicate uh, and that, that they are applied at communication and messages applied throughout the entire Tiaka agenda and communications uh, channel, one voice. We had revised membership categories with clear descriptions of value proposition, uh, a revised strategic focus and priorities. Uh, we, we were a lot in contact with our members uh, on surveys, one-to-ones, better understanding what they expected from Tiaka, how they would like to see us in future. Uh, we set up scorecards and KPI monitoring uh, internally to make sure that the board is better uh, prepared uh, to work together with the new director general that we were going to appoint, uh, appoint and which we have of course appointed in the meantime, but there was a clear uh, governance uh, model also there in place to avoid that we had too many bosses we're working on the same and not enough. Uh, we didn't want to create an army with too many generals and also no soldiers. That should have been a clear uh, responsibility in, in place. We had changes to bylaws. We modernized and really developed a, a very strong governance structure that we also write it down in a handbook that we are going to use uh, internally on top of the bylaws. 
and we wanted a more inclusive, representative uh, and agile board uh, as well and way of work. New code of conduct for all the board members, where to, to stick to and what we can expect from everybody on transparency, fairness, neutrality. Um, also investments in a Tiaka team. Uh, I'm very sorry to say, but the way the people in Miami sometimes had to work were not the best conditions, uh, not in the way they were involved, but also the way they were engaged, equipped. So that's also something we wanted to work on to give them the necessary tools to perform a great job. Um, and then finally, we want to have more opportunities to have closer interactions uh, with our members eh? through service, uh, but also with our newsletters and with one-to-ones, but also meet a board that we want to organize on different uh, events. So a long agenda with a lot of different things that we managed to do in a, in a fairly short period of, of only six months, uh, and which uh, we are really pleased to, uh, to see where we are today. That means that when we look at the changes of the bylaws and the governance, um, we have the director general now in place, eh? uh, a long process of hiring him, very happy uh, that uh, Glenn became available on the market and that he was part of the people interested and that we could hire him with all this knowledge of, of the industry, but also that we could have this strong director general that could act and manage the association as a, as a CEO, I would say, having full control, full uh, authority and full empowerment on the day-to-day -day work of the association. We have an extended and diverse board of directors with very clear mandate and strategy, also representing the global industry. We have an increased number of seats uh, for the board, but we are reserving seats uh, for each stakeholder type and also regional representatives so that at all moments, uh, we as a board truly have a global focus and representing the entire industry. We have introduced fixed terms. That means nobody can be a board member of Tiaka for 20 years. That means that after two terms of uh, four years, people have to leave the board uh, so that we will always have a good change of new people, new ideas coming in, which we believe will be better for the association. We are going to have the board uh, appoint the officers. That means not only chair and vice chair, but also treasurer and secretary are now unpaid board functions rather than treasurer and secretary in the past being paid uh, functions. Like I said, an extensive code of conduct focusing on this transparency, uh, fairness and neutrality. We have created an executive committee that's up to eight board members that will engage a bit more active uh, with the uh, managing director uh, and which will act a bit as a day-to-day -day, um, soundboard uh, to the director general, can also take some intermediate decisions before board decisions are being taken so that we can act as an association pretty fast uh, and quick. Working more on paperless processes, doing a lot of things electronically on the board towards some members uh, so that also there we increase efficiency and we show the paperless uh, focus that we should have as an industry as well. And we have set up and created uh, task forces uh, to be uh, more flexible in delivery uh, of, of different duties and challenges. This is a might look at first at a complex drawing, but it gives a bit of an idea how we look. The dark orange is all our members. From our members, we we have the trustee members, they have voting rights at the annual general meeting. So no bylaws, for example, but also all the financials have to be agreed with the trustees. From the trustees, we will select a board of directors, which is now possible up to 22 in total. From these 22, we will have four mandates for um, uh, the secretary, uh, the vice chair, the chair and the Chair, Vice Chair, Treasurer and Secretary, sorry, and four other directors, they will form the Executive Committee and together with the Director General, we consider them to be the management team. The dark blue is everything to do with the association and the day-to-day -day business and the office in Miami, all the projects. And there we make a clear cut with, with the board. Uh, there the Director General is fully in charge and he will report on strategy, on finances to the board. And then, of course, for the projects and different clusters and working groups, uh, the association will be able uh, to have the participation of different members being a trustees uh, or just a normal uh, members. So 
So that is the uh, the organizational setup on how we want to work. Uh, so this is the first moment where we would like to stay, take a small uh, stop and, and have some questions. I saw that we already had some questions in the chat box. So let me have a look. I think there's a question about board members in there, Stephen, which yeah. I think may have been uh, addressed. Um, perhaps well, you can. We are really happy with the four new board members. I think they are strengthening to the board uh, because of the experience. It's good to see that it's also a bit of a diversity uh, on, on different levels, also on the age level, but also from the industry type. Yes, we have more board positions open. Uh, our aim is not to have the 23, 22 board members filled as soon as possible. It's not about the seats. It's about what they can bring to Tiaka, make Tiaka stronger. And like I said, we will always keep some positions open to make sure that we have the best mix between uh, regions, industry types. Um, so we might welcome some other board members soon, but not necessarily um, very quickly. Stephen, I don't know you can see there's a question there that any yeah. uh, ship was expected in the board. Yeah, I, I have indeed uh, that question as well. Do we have, we already have the shippers, uh, the European Shippers Council in the board. Uh, and like I said, we want to have a, a fair representative of all industry stakeholders. That means that shippers, for example, is one category where we would uh, like to see a, a bit more involvement. Uh, we have the same, for example, like on South America. So yes, on industry types and region, we really aim to have a very good um, uh, board representation. I also saw that question on, on the, uh, the cash uh, drain, and maybe that was a little bit of a strong verb, but I think from 2010 to 2019, 2020, uh, despite uh, sometimes having been able to organize the ACF, we were not able to structurally uh, make Tiaka cash positive. So every year we were losing some of our cash. Sometimes we were able to make a small step forward in an ACF year, but then we were losing again too much money in the non-ACF year. So when the ACF before 2010, when Tiaka was more or less the sole organizer of a really big event uh, where the ACF was making a uh, really good money for the association covering for a two year period of all our expenses uh, and even keep some, some positive cash that stopped after 2010. Uh, so our goal is very clear now. Now we want to be cash positive every year, despite if there is an ACF or not, the cooperation with Messe Munich allows us uh, to have a, a less um, less exposure as Tiaka and work in a more, uh, more balanced way. Uh, I don't have the, I haven't heard really uh, yet. Uh, so I'm not sure if he was uh, looking for an IATA Tiaka meeting soon. I think that they first uh, might need to look at a successor for Glyn. Uh, but first it's very clear and Glyn will come back later on. Uh, we have no, uh, our goal is to work with everybody in the industry, uh, no exclusiveness. So if, if, if any time Ayata wants to talk to us, we are always going to be open uh, to talk to anybody and to work with anybody if it benefits uh, the industry. Huh? So there is no, uh, no problem. Uh, we will remind Ayata uh, that uh, they need to replace Glenn and we will not tell them, but we will make sure that Tiaka is going to be doing such a good job that they will feel the pressure from that uh, from that angle. Stephen, there was a question from from Michael uh, Mackey about strategic purpose behind the reorganization. Are we yeah. moving to become a campaigning organization or a lobby group? Well, I think none of them uh, and all of them in a sense that um, we will lobby where necessary. Absolutely, it's going to be part of our job. If we need to campaign in the benefit of air cargo, we will also do it. And in the benefit of Tiaka, the most important thing is we want to be a, an organization that unites the air cargo industry, that represents our members and that brings our members together to the benefit of the industry. More than ever, I think that we want to be an organization that delivers content, that delivers value. Uh, 
uh, and get a bit away of what we did in the past where we were more lobby group and event organizer than truly delivering projects. Eh? So I think it's, it's the contrary, uh, that we have set up an organization and that we have created the internal tools uh, in order to deliver projects uh, and work on content-based uh, topics uh, in the years ahead of us. Okay, Stephen. Sorry, can I just follow that up? Stephen, what sort of projects are you talking about? Yeah, I think a good example, and Glenn will talk about it later on, is the one we did on pharmaceuticals with COVID-19. Another one we are working on is the sustainability. We don't want to just talk about sustainability. We actually want to see what we can do as an organization to help our members to become more sustainability. Another one will be quality. Uh, so there are several ones where we are looking at and where we will see uh, some of them might be like long lasting campaigns where we will work on. Other ones might be, might be really projects uh, defined for a certain period and, and a one off shot. Depending on what comes from the industry and what we see as opportunities uh, where we can make a difference, uh, we will do such projects. Is that an answer, Michael? Yes, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So, Glyn, I think we have covered those questions. If no other questions, then I suggest we continue and uh, I'll like to give the word to you. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and as Stephen has already mentioned, um, the role of Tiaka is very much about aligned with the member, the member needs, the member direction, the member strategy. So we've also looked at how we actually engage with the broader membership and through the transformation process affected quite a number of changes. Um, we revamped the website, both visuals and the content. We simplified it so that it's actually now relevant and timely and regularly updated. We revised our communication vehicles. Um, Tiaka, for a very relatively small organization, had a lot of um, parallel communications going in, uh, out, which was not the most efficient. So we've actually dropped the paper-based publication at the moment, and we focused on digital communications. Uh, social media presence has actually been refocused on, um, and it's been insourced. So much of the communications is currently now being done by the team in Miami. We've also looked at branding so that there is consistency across all of the channels. Um, and probably one of the most important uh, introductions to the transformation process was a member portal, which is very much a way of the members actually enhancing their business relationships with other members. Um, it's called Glue Up. It, it provides the connectivity. It provides a searchable and uh, linked relationship tool. It also provides a repository for people to post um, information as well as us posting information to the members. And we see this as a way of really enhancing the membership value as we go forward. Now a little bit more about the uh, actual membership itself. Um, there's a little over 400 members today. And as Stephen said, the uniqueness of Tiaka is the fact that it is from across the supply chain. And as you can actually see when we look and break this down by sector, that there is a very broad um, uh, representation. Uh, the number of freight forwarders has been boosted by the uh, inclusion of neutral air partners uh, last year. Um, but in, within that, each of these categories have a very good mix of global multinationals, for example, ground handlers with WFS, Swissport, etc., as well as local ground handlers that might be in just one or two locations. The same as the freight forwarders. We've got multinationals, major freight forwarders, as well as some of the smaller, medium and regional based. Um, so it's really a, a, probably one of the strongest aspects of the Tiaka value proposition. It means that when the association comes up with a position on a topic, it's actually representing the views from the entire supply chain. And I think that's really shown and it's demonstrated its value in the last 12 months. Uh, we will talk about the project that Stephen referred to in, in a few slides. Um, but that's really one of the things that we're, we're very encouraged by. And as Stephen said, we would obviously try and encourage more participants from across the sector as we go forward. Geographically, they are also very well spread throughout the uh, entire planet. This is a, a global industry and Tiaka is a global association. 
So it needs to reflect the views of the global community. And again, when you see the breakdown, um, it's actually very diverse in the sense that we have uh, uh, Europe with 140 plus members, North America and Asia, very similar, around 90 members, Middle East, 33, Latin America, 22, and Africa, 23. So it is a, a broad spread. And within that broad spread, of course, we have each of the different sectors uh, represented. Um, but again, one of the values going forward will be how we can actually enhance and broaden that membership even further. So that was just a very quick session on, on the membership. Uh, I'm not sure if there are any specific questions that uh, relate to that particular topic. Uh, I see a question there, glue up. Uh, that's just the name of the tool. Um, it's very much like a, a LinkedIn type of situation or a LinkedIn type of tool that's within the actual association itself. So it's private to the members and it allows, allows the members to connect with, um, as it were, the, the right and appropriate um, contact within partner organizations elsewhere within Tiaka. So they can search and find and enhance business relations. They can make connections, they can post information. Um, and it's also a tool that, that can actually be used to share information across the membership. So it's, it's a very powerful tool. Um, and uh, it's something that we've already uh, seen just in the last few months that it's been rolled out. A lot of very positive uptake. Perfect. Thank you, Glyn. I don't see any other questions no. on the membership. Great. So we'll go to industry priorities. Yes, please. When we were uh, looking uh, last year at all the changes, we also uh, very much looked at what is going to be priority for the industry. Uh, where should we focus on? That resulted in a few topics that we identified together with our members as key factors uh, that we should uh, take into account while uh, writing our, our strategy. One of them was uh, the partnerships and collaboration. Uh, how are we going to work with the industry? Another one was sustainability that we had put on the agenda uh, starting in Budapest last year and that uh, grew momentum considerably in the past year. So sustainability was there to stay. Another one was digitization, uh, something very high on, our, on the agenda of our industry uh, in general. And of course, uh, some topics that other ones uh, are also talking about, but very important to us and to our members was the safety and security, everything to do with liberalization and of course, also the value of air cargo. How could we better promote air cargo so that everybody would really understand the importance of it? Um, so Glenn, maybe you can go a bit in detail on each of these topics and say a bit more on how we look at them as TIAC. Great, thank you, Stephen. Um, and, and very well introduced because these are critical and it, and it goes to, to Michael's question earlier as well as what do we see the role? When it comes to digitalization, I think we've all learned to work differently over the last 12 months. Um, the way that we've embraced technology because we were forced to, because we had no other choice, is something that we need to capture and continue with going forward. The industry had to exchange information because it was physically not possible to share paper. We had situations people didn't want to share pens to actually sign for documents. So alternative measures and alternative solutions were found. What we need to do though, as we said, is as an industry, we have to actually challenge ourselves to do more. Data is, is critical and a digital uh, plan for the industry and for each member of the industry is critical going forward. So we would urge all our members and all supply chain partners to come up as it were with a digitalization or a transformation plan so that they can actually have efficient and transparent and optimized solutions. Um, and innovation is key in this area. So we will be doing what we can to urge and uh, showcase the successes um, and to work with all of the supply chain partners, as well as the standard setting bodies about the need for industry relevant standards. But as an association, we won't be getting involved in the standard setting. We feel our role is much more important to actually promote the innovation, showcase the, the success and urge people to, as it were, uh, embrace the future. Stephen's very eloquently talked about the need for partnerships and collaboration. Again, this is something that the last 12 months has really shown how this industry can really step up during the time of crisis and work together around a common vision. We have to imply that uh, 
sorry, we have to apply the same approach as an association. We have to identify and work with partner associations that have a shared and common objective to the work program that we are introducing. We as an industry need to create that environment of trust and respect, because if you're talking about sharing data, if we're talking about moving the precious cargoes that the industry is moving, you have to do that in a environment where you trust your partners. We also have to focus on the end result. It's very critical, and we will talk about this a little bit later on as well, that we don't just focus on moving the boxes. We need to focus what's what's inside the box. And of course, the standard motto that, that the industry has been talking about for too long, but it's now been in actually employing it, which is united, we can conquer the eight challenges. Divided, we will fall and we will fail. As Stephen mentioned, sustainability is a very important work program. It's not just about the environment. We have defined sustainability for Tiaka as about the people, the planet, and prosperity. Um, the plus two is the fact that it's enabled by innovation and partnerships. So in this particular area, we will be working to unite the industry around a common vision. We absolutely have to work towards equal opportunities and a diverse workforce. We were very pleased to support the Women in Aviation program recently launched by Meantime and Change Horizon. I think this is one of a number of initiatives which will help drive the industry forward to create those ever needed uh, and more equalized opportunities. Um, we also need to do more with regards to environmental responsibility and factor it into all of the business decisions. And we see our role as Tiaka again as providing a showcase for the innovation and success. And this is very much linked to the sustainability awards that we will talk about uh, in a little bit later. Some of the other priorities that we're actually looking at, and Stephen mentioned safety and security. Um, this, of course, is the, is the opening door. It's the gatekeeper. Any industry, particularly ours, must have safety and security as its first priority. But we need to work with governments. So we urge governments to implement and promote practical and measured regulations. Those regulations need to be evaluated regularly to make sure that they are relevant to the changing times. We also need governments to work with industry to make sure that there is zero tolerance with regards to unlawful behavior. We've been talking about this as an industry for several years about the counterfeit, about those who actually want to seek um, uh, and cause disruption to the supply chain by causing unlawful interference, by sending through counterfeit products, um, by deliberately not complying with the regulations with regards to safety and declarations. And we need governments to really continue to work with us and then to step up and take action when those particular parties are actually identified. And we would also ask regulators to focus their particular activity, not just on the air sector, but of course, an effective supply chain is based on smart regulations from point of production through to the point of consumption. So it's about all of the regulatory bodies, whether or not it's law enforcement, trading standards, um, export, import, as well as the uh, air supply chain uh, regulators as well needing to work collectively uh, together. As Stephen also mentioned, the value of air cargo, this is something that the last 12 months, because of the non-stop focus through the, the media, whether or not it's the traditional news media, channels online, uh, through social media, through your spread selves as the trade media, etc. You know, the air cargo industry has really stepped up to support both the society through PPE and then subsequently vaccine. Um, but going forward, we need to align much more with the UN sustainability goals. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. We need to promote the value of air cargo as airlines start to put capacity back in, into service, as it were. We need to promote the value that air cargo can bring to them. Uh, it was probably the only part of the industry that was generating cash last year. But of course, we need to continually focus on the need for providing enhanced ship of value. And that means, of course, providing enhanced facilities and infrastructure. So we have a role to play to communicate through our membership and relationship with the shippers through to all parties in the supply chain, what those demands and what those needed infrastructures are. As Stephen mentioned, liberalization can have many forms. It starts with a free and open economy. 
the global economy is great for helping nations uh, get to their products and get their economies uh, moving, helping developing nations and uh, those least developed with opening up global markets. So we call upon the continuance of an open global economy. And with that, the role that air cargo can play. And as we all know, air cargo transports about 35% of international trade by value. But it needs to do so with fair and liberalized services, both in the air and on the ground. And of course, liberalization also means that the border management controls need to be effective and efficient. And therefore, we can have the most efficient industry possible. And the last area we're going to focus on here is the need for people development, um, not just within, as it were, Tiaka and Tiaka's members, but across the whole industry. People will need to reskill, they'll need to continually upskill. As the industry demands change, as the world changes, we need to evolve with that evolving world. So we need to have development programs in place. We need to be able to attract, entice, and retain the next generation of leaders. We also need to be able to embrace um, the, as it were, the experience skills that have uh, been prevalent in the industry. And we need to be able to merge those collectively together so that there can be a, as it were, a melting of the two great pots that we've got, which is experience and youthful entrepreneurship. And then I think the industry will be in the best position to be agile and innovative. So those are just some of the quick industry priorities. Um, one of the things we talked about in people development, and of course, training is very critical with that. Um, you, you may or may not be aware that we've had a partnership with ICAO since 2019. So it's uh, just before the, the pandemic caused many things to change. And it was about delivering a safe supply chain course, which we do in partnership. Um, this so far has been designed for a virtual classroom environment. We have six scheduled to run this year. We've run one in February very successfully. Um, and ultimately, we hope that through this supply chain, we can help educate um, both government regulators, as well as interest, industry participants, as well as users of the supply chain and customers about the need for safe supply chain uh, considerations, which is both safe from the employee perspective, regulatory perspective and cargo perspective. So I'll, I'll stop there in case there are any questions on the priorities as we as we see them. Lynn, before we do the questions, I would like to add one thing on the collaboration. Uh, we always say that IATA, uh, IATA, TIACA is uniquely positioned by representing all members of the of the air cargo industry, and that is uh, something that we should play as uh, more as a as a as a strong card. Uh, that's that is our uniqueness, that is our strength, and that's where we should focus on that. That puts us in a perfect position to indeed unite the industry rather than than a focus on the differences but it also means that on, on certain topics and i think it's important we are not going to be on certain topics number five in line saying the same if we feel that other organizations are better placed uh, on certain topics we have no problem not to be side on side but to support other ones and for some initiatives where we are better placed we will ask support from from other organizations we really believe that uh, also, on, on that front, we should work together to the benefit of the air cargo industry, uh, something that we not always did in the past, where we look too much at our own uh, internal uh, agenda. We have two questions, uh, Glenn. One is uh, about security and then cyber security. Um, but I think if we talk about digital and if we talk about security in general, cyber security is today something that you that you cannot ignore. It's part of day to day life. It's like driving a car means you need insurance. But that being said, we are not an IT company. So uh, the cybersecurity that we will talk about and promote will not include uh, in detail programs. And then there is the question, Glenn, maybe for you that you can answer. Will be there any TIACA approved uh, training schools? Uh, a great question, actually. Um, one of the areas that we will be looking at over the next few months, it's something the board has asked me to um, put together some evaluation of, is what is Tiaka's role with regards to, to training? Um, we're not a big enough institution to probably create ourselves a significant portfolio of, of training. We had that one course that I mentioned. But it's certainly an area that we will be 
um, evaluating, is there a role that we can play, even if it's just, for example, of, of bringing together what training exists and making it available to our members so that they can find it in one place, perhaps doing some evaluation. So it's a great question. I would expect over the next few months, we'll probably be looking at that as a particular project. Thanks, Glenn. Then there's a question from, from Donald. What's your view on the evolving US-China trade situation? Because the friction of the Trump era did not end with Biden taking over the reins. So in fact, trade yeah. has become a problem between more and more countries over a variety of issues. Yeah, that is actually a very interesting, a very good question. Uh, thanks to Don there. I mean, it's interesting that even during the end of the Trump administration, imports from China were running at an all time high. Um, and I think, as we mentioned earlier, we as an association call for fair and liberalized trade. We believe that conditions should be fair to all parties um, and that we also believe that only through an effective global economy can global society move forward. Uh, the air cargo industry, in fact, all the modes of transport are fundamentally important to ensure that global trade can move fast and effective. We saw what happened in, uh, in Suez just over the last week, how critical supply chains are and how what may seem to be a, a small situation in terms of few wins, the consequential impact um, have been quite significant and felt around many parts of the world. So we would hope that, and it's not just US China, but there's also some potential conflicts as well between um, the UK and the US. There's a number of digital tax proposals being put in, uh, being put out there. There's various other mechanisms. We, we hope to be working closely with the WTO so that we can again bring our views to the WTO with regards to the need for open and fair policies and regulations and how the air cargo industry can support uh, global economic prosperity. Um, and we would hope that all administrations balance their views with regards to the roles of protectionism versus open globalism, because history has proven that protectionist economies don't have a long term um, prospect as effective as open, more globalized economies. I don't know if there are any other questions That's, there. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Uh, I, I see one about um, pilots. Um, that there was a call from the TR, sorry, the ICAO Secretary General um, calling for pilots and other supply chain staff being prioritized um, for COVID-19 vaccines. I, I'm not familiar with the full extent of the quote, but um, we do agree with regards to the fact that the logistical staff and workers who are in the front line have done an effective and incredible job last year as essential workers. Um, many of these people were, were at, out going to work on a day-to-day -day basis when the rest of us were actually sheltering at home, in my case in particular. So I think we have to recognize that they did a tremendous job, all of the people in the air cargo supply chain, moving these products around the world. And as essential workers, I would agree that they should be in the essential worker category, wherever that stands with regards to the, the COVID-19 um, vaccines. Um, so I, I haven't seen exactly the context of the way that it was actually presented, but I think they should be recognized that in fact, moving the vaccines around the world is putting, again, logistical staff in the front line of, of potentially um, uh, very difficult areas and very difficult parts of the world. So it is critical that they be protected um, whilst they're protecting the rest of us. I'm not sure if there are any more, Stephen, or if we should go to the next uh, section. I don't have any more questions, but I also did not see this question. Okay. So thanks for uh, stepping in. COVID topic uh, we cannot ignore. Eh? Um, COVID has caused many aspects of global society to change, eh? from how we think about ourselves, the day-to-day -day work or communities, but also the health or health and the impact we can have on others is something that has changed. Eh? Air Cargo went through a similar dramatic change. Prior to COVID, uh, we were mostly focused on moving the boxes. Eh? We knew it had a monetary value and that it was really part of global economy but we very often overlook the value to society. And COVID changed that. And that's the, that's the, the good thing for air cargo. It, it was the best PR campaign we could imagine if it was 
about showing the value of our industry to the public and to the people. We started focusing on what was inside the box, what impact it could have, and how important all these boxes were. It started with the PPEs, then it also became the life supplies, the vaccines. It was very much focused, but in all these other years in the past, we also transported this kind of goods, not in the same quantity, not in the same urgency, but in every crisis in the world, whenever there was something happening, air cargo played a vital role. And, and, and today, I think everybody has learned the importance of cargo. Eh? In the industry, united, working together, we also were able to deliver uh, around a common objective as we never did before. Eh? And what we did really mattered. Uh, and, and we are going to try and see how we can keep that shared vision long after COVID uh, is consigned to the history, history books. I think that's what we can do and where we as Tiaga can play an active role in, in making sure that this is remembered uh, long after uh, COVID is being remembered. So Glenn, can you tell us a bit more on what we did? On Thank you, Stephen. Topic? Yes, and, and as Stephen mentioned earlier in uh, the session today, um, and question with regards to what role we will play with the projects. This was something that was identified very early on. As soon as there was a global pandemic declared, we as an industry, as individuals, knew that ultimately there would need to be a vaccine. So this is something that the Tiaka board, um, very early on, well in advance of, of any even uh, trials being announced, etc., knew that we had to prepare for what would have been a heavily focused on air cargo distribution system when vaccines were event eventually be made available. So Tiaka partnered with Pharma.Aero, um, which is another association dedicated to the area of, of pharma activity. Um, we together came together and, and formed a project called Sunrays. And they started work in the middle of last year. And the first thing they started to do was, was conduct some readiness surveys. Um, how ready would the industry be? Um, and obviously it showed quite a, a few gaps in that first survey, which then helped feature into some work plan and work programs. So the project then actually produced a white paper back in December, which was really about how the industry could prepare what the requirements would be, um, followed it up with another survey, which as one would expect to actually see a, a greater degree of preparedness. And we continued the work because the next area that was critical was, was well, how are we now going to be able to, or how would we be able to be successful and play a valuable role in the distribution of the vaccines? So a second document was uh, released in February of this year, and it really very much focused on the success stories of, of uh, already associated areas and communities that have already started work in this area, and as Stephen said, have a history of moving vaccines and it was very key and very critical to focus on community-based collaboration. And with regards to vaccine, it also requires a very much more open and integrated relationship with the national health authorities, as we have already seen, sadly, in some cases around the world, where countries may have access to vaccine, but they don't have a mechanization or a distribution system in place that's sufficient to actually be able to filter those vaccines through to where they need, which is into people's arms. Other countries, um, and you have to say that, that Israel was first here, uh, I think Bahrain and, and the UAE, um, and then the UK and even the US in recent, recent weeks uh, have actually stepped up and have got much more of a balance between their capability of disbursement and their ability for the supply chain, as it were, to replenish. And that's really where you need is you need a balance between disbursement and replenishment. Vaccines do have a limited shelf life. Vaccines can and will be needed all around the world. So you don't want countries to stockpile. You don't want countries to be to throw away and to have wastage. So we produced uh, this second document, released it in February. We followed it up with further information. We produce a number of fact sheets. We continue to work with a number throughout Pharmada Aero partners, a number of the pharmaceutical and vaccine manufacturers, um, as they are making changes to the vaccines, perhaps looking at how they, they can be transported in different temperature control conditions, etc. We will feed that information through to the industry as well. We know that the challenge with regards to vaccine distribution is unprecedented. 
um, not just in geographical terms, in terms of moving vaccine to potentially 200 plus countries and territories, but the conditions of which each of them have to be moved. Speed and timeliness is an issue. Security is critical. We cannot allow as individuals to have any unlawful interference and any risk that the vaccines could be tampered with during the journey all the way through to disbursement. We need to make sure it's reliable and transparent because as we said before, this is about replenishment or about activation of vaccine programs. So we were working very closely as well through um, partners at uh, UNICEF who are working with the COVAX facility and needing that particular activity. Um, and they've been uh, very open with the industry and with us and with others with regards to the challenges that they are experiencing, particularly when it comes to some of the COVID vaccines now, which are going through the COVAX facility, because they're tackling countries which have been severely impacted by the reduction of passenger services. So there's the removal of belly capacity. Um, and unfortunately, in many of those countries, they don't have an infrastructure designed to cater for temperature sensitive cargo. So there's had to been a lot of uh, communication and collaboration to make sure the right vaccines were able to be dispersed to the countries that could handle them. This is just a very quick snapshot of the currently approved vaccines. Um, and, and it's really trying to, to present over the challenges and complexity that as more and more vaccine um, producers get approved in different countries and different production sites, the complexity for the air cargo industry multiplies significantly. So you end up with a, a very complex scenario. And this last picture on this slide, sorry, it's a busy slide, is really illustrating the current clinical trials going on. There were 250 candidate vaccine development programs at the height. A number of those have actually dropped off now. A number of the other manufacturers are looking at using, as it were, licensed production, so they can actually use the um, approved and certified recipes for different sites for producing. Um, as we know, the Serum Institute in India, caters and in fact Belgium have been in the front running of much of the production uh, for the first vaccines. This is now starting to spread throughout the world and we're now starting to see a larger volume of, uh, of global exports and therefore global imports of the vaccines, including the first through the COVAX facility in Latin America and through into Africa. And we expect the situation to continue at, at the pace that it's going through. It'll probably be most of the year, if not all of the year. Um, and particularly when you look at the production challenges in some cases, uh, it may actually go through into perhaps 18 months worth of total distribution before the world is sufficiently vaccinated at what they will call herd immunity levels. So I don't know if there's any questions with regards to the work that we're doing in that area. I don't see any questions, Glenn, unless somebody did send them only to you. But I think we have I been communicating a lot about this topic, so I think that in the past months the communication has been really good. Excellent. Okay, so we can go on to the next area. Um, sustainability. Stephen's mentioned it, I've mentioned it, it is a critical area going forward. Um, it starts with, for us, the role we play, which is through the awards, through showcasing. Um, of the success that's been achieved in this area, and we're, we're uh, proud to continue that through this year as well. We will have a webinar, part of our education and outreach program. We'll announce the, the dates of that later on in the next few slides. We conducted a major survey um, with regards to the broad topic of sustainability, and we'll be uh, announcing the survey results of that through the webinar and discussing it with industry leaders. As I say, we have a dedicated working group. We're looking at various industry projects. But the key is we want to showcase the leaders. But it's very important we continue to remind people that sustainability is not just about the environment. The environmental aspects are, of course, one of the, the key components, looking at uh, emissions, looking at waste, looking at energy, looking at water and recycling, uh, biodiversity, air quality, noise, wildlife trafficking. These are all of the environmental factors which a solid, robust sustainability program uh, will hopefully cater and incorporate. But it's also about uh, the people, the planet, so the planet and then the people. So it's about safety, education, the employee experience, diversity and inclusion, community, 
and of course human trafficking which is something as well which we need to have a greater focus on as a as a global society and the last of our p's it's people it's planet and it's about prosperity we believe a prosperous industry is one that continue to thrive and flourish and grow and therefore it can enable a, enable and become a force for good and a value creator for the whole global community so it's critical that these three components are worked on in tandem or together through our particular program is, is one area and we will work with others who are uh, focusing on different aspects of this um, and this is a very key program for us going forward as mentioned we will be holding a webinar at the end of next month um, where we'll be talking about the sustainability survey um, and again, looking and focusing on some of the key issues that have come up and how as an industry association, we can actually incorporate these into our strategic plans, our member plans, and help move the industry forward in what is a critical enabler going. As I say, I think it's, it's going to play an increasingly important role in the coming years. So another stop check there, uh, Stephen, with regards to sustainability. I think that you are very well in explaining everything because I don't, again, don't see any questions, Glenn. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So, and apologies that this slide looks busy, um, but the journey ahead, we do see it as a forward journey, a growth journey, but there will be some bumps in the road. Um, some of these influences on this page are positive. Of course, e-commerce, we fully anticipate and expect the double digit growth to continue. Um, accelerated and became a lifeline for many consumers during the last 12 months as traditional retail channels were, were closed. A number of the retail outlets are reviewing their uh, online versus uh, bricks and mortar presence. So we would anticipate seeing some strategic changes there going forward through the course of this year as economies and societies start to reopen. We can expect to see some changes in the retail space. Digitalization. Um, this is not a should have, this is an urgent, we've talked about it, we will continue to talk about it, it's a critical enabler of an efficient industry going forward. Economic recovery, um, the IMF is actually projecting that this year the global economy will grow about 5.5% uh, uh, and next year the projection is 4.2%. This comes off of a 3.5% contraction for 2020 and as in previous times, they are expecting the developing and the emerging markets to actually lead the way and forecasting this year for those economies to grow by over 6%, 6.3%, with the developed economies growing by about 4.3%, which is still a, a sizable move forward um, compared to the contraction that we saw last year. But it's also bodes well for what one would say would be a V-shaped recovery um, which is obviously something we've seen in air cargo with volumes bouncing back incredibly quickly. Supply chain resilience. Um, President Biden, one of his uh, announcements was to have a project looking at supply chain resilience and many companies and countries around the world are looking at resilience. We've seen not just the pandemic in the last 12 months, but we've seen uh, port uh, congestion. Long Beach, Los Angeles have had for several months unprecedented volumes and levels of ships um, uh, moored out at sea because there was problems and challenges of getting the cargo and the containers through. Um, the train rail services were full, then it was difficult getting the, the containers out on the road or on the rail. Obviously, we saw last week of what happened in the Suez Canal. Thankfully, the Ever Given has been refloated now, but 300 plus ships were, were as it were, backlogged. And as they start moving through, there will be a knock-on effect and you'll start to see some backlog in perhaps some European ports as you end up with a congestion of, of ships trying to offload cargo. And it goes to show that just a four or five day interruption can start to have a quite a significant impact on different areas of, of the world, whether or not it was the oil container ships that were, were coming through. So some countries had to ration oil other areas where they were waiting for key components of production lines, etc. So the supply chain resilience will be a strong focus, we believe, in the years ahead. One of the biggest negative challenges that the industry will have to face is the slow returning of the slow forecast return of international long haul passenger travel, the expected return of short haul, narrow bodied 
air cargo, or sorry, uh, air services will probably resume much, much quicker. Um, but air cargo was not really heavily prevalent on, on those type of services. So the 50% of cargo that moved in bellies uh, is obviously continued to be a challenge for the next probably three years. So we expect to see the continued pressure on freighter utilization, perhaps continued utilization of passenger aircraft for cargo and the operations, perhaps to a lesser degree, but to a continued measured degree, particularly to those countries which haven't yet resumed full or won't yet have resumed full passenger services later this year. We can expect to see new players um, coming into the market. Amazon has contracted for quite a lot of, of as it were, their own um, capacity, particularly focused on the US right now. But as they start to get better grips with predictive analytics of uh, moving the inventory around, we can expect to see them perhaps putting some of their capacity over future years available in the open market. Um, we expect to see a continued focus on unmanned vehicles. There's many countries around the world now that have actually licensed to operate these uh, domestically. Um, the international uh, challenge is still existing, but, but domestic utilization serving a lot of communities, whether or not it's in Canada, in Africa, some very, um, very successful projects and programs that have already been introduced in Africa. They're looking at it in America, US, China, many other places as well. So we expect to see that a continue growth trend. Distributed production. Very similar to the supply chain resilience, uh, we expect to see manufacturers start to evaluate whether or not they should actually have all their production in, in one or perhaps two or three different locations so that there is some of that inbuilt redundancy. When you have disruption in one, you don't actually have an impact on the entire organization. So we expect to see that as a, a continuing trend. Uh, we've already talked about vaccine. Rising cost of oil is something which is is something which is quite a concern now. As economies have started to reopen, we've seen the demand for oil consumption uh, has rise domestically, which has given to a rise in price. And I just checked before the call. Um, currently, jet aviation fuel is about uh, running at seventy five dollars, uh, and compare that a barrel to thirty, which is where it was twelve months ago. Um, unfortunately, if it continues this upward trend, then it also starts to make the economics of running passenger aircraft for cargo only operations slightly more challenging. Um, because, of course, they're, they're not freighters, so you can't get the full utilization, the full capacity or payload that a freighter has. And with the fuel price as it was at low levels during the COVID situation, then it was actually quite economic to do so. But that will be a more of a, as it were, an economic um, challenge going forward if the price of oil continues to rise. And of course, we would expect to see new business models. Uh, I think we've already started to see quite a bit of merger and, and acquisition activity in the last uh, last few months. We've seen a number of, of different evolving situations, um, maritime ship operators uh, purchasing aircraft to put into the fleet, which is again, something which is very innovative and very interesting. And it's all about the need going forward for blended supply chains. Um, and it's about serving the global economy. So I think you'll see a lot more also with regards to standards and digitalization of where the various modes will work together to actually try and create the most effective, um, as it were, common standards possible to help the shipper in its uh, efficient business. Two further influences I'd just like to touch upon very quickly. We think a successful industry, any successful industry, needs to be a mirror of the society that it's actually serving. And we think the air cargo industry is one, particularly as it's global in nature, and it's global in, in terms of trying to appeal to shippers and consumers and manufacturers and wholesalers and retailers. It's an industry that's there to support everybody in their business needs. So we need to understand and reflect what those emerging trends are. When you look at the next generation of workforce and consumer, they have different values than previous generations. Generation Z and Generation Y were very much focused on, as it were, consumer trends. Um, as it were, there was a, a high consumption factor. Generation Z are coming in with, with different values. They have a different approach. Their view of technology is different. They have technology embedded um, in fact, I think they were born with technology embedded. They certainly em embrace it in all of their um, social and, and work activities. 
Their network connectivity is at an all time high. Everything is community based. So as an industry, if we want to attract that workforce in, we need to be able to provide the environment that they are most comfortable with. We also need to be aware that they may start progressing down different consumer trends. They may be focusing what they need rather than what they want. So as an industry, we need to be able to provide solutions and services which are open, fast and transparent because they are also looking for um, effective and transparent information. And we also need to focus on the UN sustainability goals. Air cargo has a tremendous role to play in helping developing nations get their products to global marketplaces, which will then help, as it were, in achieve the no poverty and various other objectives that uh, the UN has set for, as it were, global society. And air cargo, an effective air cargo industry, we think has a key role to play in helping all of the UN goals, not just on the people side, but on the prosperity for national economic side as well. So with that, Stephen, that's just a, a quick run through of some of the influences and um, challenges and positive opportunities we see going forward. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, I, I do apologize to everybody that we are going a bit beyond our, our original schedule. Um, uh, and we have already a few people leaving. It's only a few slides left. So since there are no questions, uh, Glenn, let's just continue and, and try to uh, do the last few slides in a, in a short time frame and then still have some time for questions or, or discussion. It's a heavy slide coming up now, so it takes some time, okay. but it's an interesting one. It's about our executive summit, um, which we want to organize in 2021 in September in uh, San Francisco. It's going to be a two plus two event. That means two days of conference and two days of uh, an innovation tour in Silicon Valley with a focus on innovation and the future. Uh, we really, after almost a year and a half uh, no conferences. We really look forward to have again a, a, a physical conference, a 3D conference rather than a 2D conference, uh, like we like to say. Uh, but we also do take in mind that uh, the situation might not end up as good as we want to. So we do it completely flexible with 100% refund, uh, everything taken in care on cancellation, so that we. Uh, that we can look forward to it, but also do not make any commitment. It's like booking a ticket nowadays. Every airline offers full flexibility. That's also something we want to do, uh, but we do not want to wait uh, another two years uh, before we can organize something. I think we've all experienced the benefits of digital, but also the limitations of digital. And uh, Brigitte, uh, especially since you are the first one, do contact us. Uh, we will absolutely be able to uh, to talk about uh, a free pass uh, for the press to join the uh, the event. Any other questions you might have on the executive summit, please do reach out to us. Uh, more will become available soon anyway on the program and the tour and everything. Another thing we want to do again uh, is there the Hall of Fame. The nominations will come out. Um, the Hall of Fame is something that Tiaka has been organizing for quite some time. And if you see the names, it's, it's a really a nice list of people uh, that uh, do deserve the respect and, and uh, the spotlight for what they have done for industry. And, and we want to, uh, to continue this and even strengthen it again a little bit. But in the last few years, we were not all, always able to give it uh, the necessary attention. So there we will do a call again to the industry, everybody in the industry to nominate people that they feel uh, meet the criteria, uh, doing something extra for the industry that they have demonstrated an innovative spirit, leadership, and especially contributed greatly to the development of the air cargo industry. Uh, that nomination will be launched on our website. Deadline is July 15th. And the idea is to have the Hall of Fame uh, award during the executive summit in San Francisco. Lynn. Thank you, Stephen. And another award that we will be handing out in San Francisco is the 2021 Sustainability Awards. Uh, this will be the third year that we're doing this with our exclusive award uh, partner and sponsor, Champ Cargo Systems, and we extend a huge debt of gratitude and appreciation to their leadership and their support for this program. Um, and we want to use the opportunity to encourage people to 
consider applying or submitting nominations across the whole realm, as it were, of the sustainability um, activity, whether or not that's including social welfare programs, looking at people, training, development, could be economic development, where they've looked at trade development, efficiency, um, business innovation and ideas. Of course, the environmental impact as well, green logistics, um, anything to reduce their carbon footprint or any areas of, of recycling or anything of interest in that area. Of course, we'd love to hear from people who've come up with some innovative solutions, whether or not that's technical partners, automation, robotics, um, advanced data analytics, ULDs, data sensors. There's so many areas of great innovation going on, and we encourage all the people in that area to submit an application and nomination. And of course, also, we want to not lose sight of the fact that partnership, you know, a lot of what's been achieved over the last 12 months is people coming together and working differently together. So we'd like to hear from people who've done something perhaps, perhaps quite unique, people and organizations they've partnered with to achieve some exceptional area of success in terms of sustainability. So we encourage all of those type of applicants to submit uh, a uh, nomination, which of course, like in previous years, would be reviewed by an independent jury. And then the finalists would present to the actual audience in San Francisco, and then there would be a, an award and presentation uh, including financial to, as it were, the small and, and startup businesses. So, Stephen, I'm not sure if we have any questions on that. Possibly not. And again, I think we'll point out not get any questions, so continue, Glenn. So, in, in just, I mean, of course, this is, this is, we don't have programs yet dealing with interplanetary space freight, but it's something we have to keep our, our eye on to the future. As an organization, we want to be forward looking and future planning. Um, so perhaps over the years to come, we will have uh, something in this area uh, as well. And with that, I think this is our last slide. Um, it just as a repeat, these are some of the dates that we have already mentioned with regards to the uh, safe supply chain training, or the sustainability for cargo webinar 29th of April, the Hall of Fame nominations, please. Um, sustainability awards, anything you can do to help promote people to submit nominations, we'd be very much appreciative of that. And we look forward to seeing everybody at the Executive Summit in 2021. So with that, Stephen, I'd hand back to you if there's any final questions and perhaps you could do a wrap up. Yeah, thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, and Bridget, we'll take that suggestion inviting Elon <laughs> Musk. Uh, uh, but, but I don't know if our audience is ready for him. <laughs> Who knows? It might be a good idea. Um, Glenn, maybe if you stop sharing, then we can see if people still want to ask a question. Then uh, it, it's easier with having everybody on the screen. Uh, I, I would like to once again thank all of you for joining in. Uh, I hope it was a bit informative. Uh, again, we will be reaching out to you more often. We also want to be open to anybody. If you, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, please do reach out to us. Uh, Tiraka has never refused in the past and will never refuse to engage uh, with the industry. That includes the media we want to engage um, and, and, and we look forward to do so. Uh, Roger, Roger, Amazon is, as far as I know, not yet a member. Is it, Lynn? No, but that's a, a good one to go after on. And we, we, we will reach out. Before. Sorry? We will reach out to them. Yeah, yeah, and we have had contact with them quite often already in the past. Um, but again, we're open to anybody uh, and, and it's up to us. Eh? I, I'm a strong believer that um, with the new Tiaka and what we show to the industry, membership is going to be uh, the result of what we do and not a goal on itself. Eh? We want to grow membership because people believe in our association. I don't want to sit here next year having grown membership but not having done anything because then it's not sustainable uh, and we are here for the long term creating the value uh, and i'm pretty sure that with the team in miami with, with kenneth with rachel they have been really doing a great job last year also on a transformation in the past years already before uh, with glenn now coming on board uh, um, and with the new board the existing board the new board members i'm pretty sure that that we really have a strong a strong team ready for the challenge and uh, that the ACA will, will year after year grow again and become stronger as an association uniting the industry and leading the industry. Yeah? 
not yet in space, but the day we go to space, like Glenn said, I think that the ARCA should be the one leading uh, our industry towards that direction. If no other questions, I'll wait two seconds to see if anybody still has a question. With that, I would like to thank all of you. Uh, wish you a, a nice day. Uh, I look forward to talk to you also. Bye-bye.